guys back to another episode of the High Level Podcast. Um, as always, join with me this evening is High Level Head Coach James Dillon, looking comfortable in his office there. All right, James? Hi, I'm good, man. I'm good. And uh, our special guest tonight, uh, we have, have on with us um, 2A WBO World Champion, Paul Weir. joining us Paul and giving us some of your time. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Thanks James. Brilliant and obviously we're all, uh, we're all in a kind of similar situation at the moment, different parts of the world. Um, yeah. Paul tell us how things are going out in Dubai mate. I mean there could be worse places to be in lockdown to be fair but how is things going out there? I suppose it's like everybody else in the world just now. We, we're in 24-7 lockdown. We can't go anymore. Even for right. our exercise, and on the UK, you can still go out and go and do your exercise. We can't leave the home at all unless we apply for a permit. And then we've got a time slot when to leave, and we've got to inform them where we're going. And we can only go to either the, the shops for messages or the medical for anything wrong with medical wise. But I think that's even changed as of today. You can't even get out for anything medical; it has to be something specific now. Right. So, so, so we, aye. That's, we're, we're in lockdown, you're in lockdown, but it seems like you are actually in lockdown versus yours feels like it's, or seems to be that it's a bit more relaxed because uh, yeah. I don't think everybody still is taking it quite as serious as they should. No, I, I don't think so, but it seems to be, you know, the, the, <clears throat> the recovery seems to be getting better or quicker mm-hmm. from what I can see on the news. seems to be more yeah. people recovering quickly. And how long have you been? How long have you been in lockdown out there? When did they put you in lockdown? I think maybe March twenty odd of March twenty twenty second twenty third of March. Mm-hmm. You know we've been kind of full lockdown. But what the first week we were kind of, it was quite lenient. You could still get out and about and go here and go there. You know although you were in lockdown, but then they just says nobody leaves anywhere. And what they've started doing the people who are out and about a lot of the personal trainers. They're out doing personal, they're, they're saying they're going, they're maybe going for meshes and they're going, they're doing trains, so they've got drones in there now and they're catching them and what they're doing is they're exposing them online and giving their names out, who they are. But what, what they do is they find you, first time they catch you, they'll find you. Second time they'll jail you and they'll deport you. Wow. So, so in they, every they, sense they, of the word. So they, don't, they, they don't mess about. Aye, I think we could maybe do me some drones here, here down at Strathclyde Park. It's still like a, still like a holiday camp down there, Jesus Christ, man. It's, fu- it's funny because Ryan Brawley was messaging me last week, you know, the boxer from, from Urban. Mm. And I said, he was asking how things were, and I said, how are things with you with the good weather? And I says, I take it about people down the, the beach park in Urban with the tops off. He came back and says, they're done just now with the tops off. He says, and the police will be stopping them. Nah, it's, it's, it's madness. It's hard, but, but, but you can understand for people, so it's hard to, for people to you know, to, to tell people, you know, they can't leave the house. Aye. I mean, it's hard, I, I know there's a, there's a virus going about, you know, an alleged virus going about, you know, and people are dying, you know, and I, I believe there is, it's affecting the older people, but I generally in the, in the ill, but we get the flu every year, we get, you know, ammonia every year, you know, and you, you never get the numbers of how many people are they die. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And you see the, the mixed reports, whether it's fake news or not, I don't know, you know, but a lot of locations where the hospitals are not as busy as what they're being put, you know, put over the, the news and the media. Uh, and the media are doing flat things to make it more controversial. That's what sells. Nah, yeah, to be fair, that's that's sort of all that's in the media you know. Uh I get I know the lockdown must be tough for a lot of people. I'm I'm not too bad. I think James, you're probably the same. You're I don't know how you're going uh, dealing with it at the moment, but I'm I'm kind of all right just now. Apart from the kids running me ragged, I'm I'm, I'm no uh, no too terrible yet. Uh, I'm, I'm just dying to get back to work type of thing. I'm just like, I'm, uh, yeah. I, I've never been off work, um, and I just I don't know how people can sit about their house all day like, and that's normal life for them. It's it's driving me crazy. Like I'm. I play with the, the, the kid and then I play with the dogs and then it's, it's just finding stuff to do is a, is a task, yeah. Aye. It's tough. Aye. 
don't get me wrong, there's a lot of a lot of houses by the end of this will have will be looking quite nice, nice likes of paint and wallpaper or whatever it is. Uh, that seems to be what people are doing at the moment. What, what are you doing to sort of fill your time, Paul? What's what's keeping you occupied at the moment in the house? I've been, I've been, tra- I've been training. Uh, you know, I'm, mm. I'm trying to do as much as I can, like say, skipping uh, shadow boxing, my stomach exercises, yoga, what I can do, things that I can do. I, I don't, I, I do, I do weights. You know, when I'm in the gym, when mm-hmm. when we're not in lockdown, I do my weights maybe three, four times a week. But I'm not. I don't rely, you know, a lot of people rely on definitely it's weights that they just want to focus on weights. I don't, if I don't do weights, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't phase me. I'm more into conditioning rather than, you know, lifting weights all the time. Mm-hmm. But I do, I do lift weights, but it's still my be all and end all. As long as I can do my, my skipping and shadow box, I'm quite happy. A lot of people seem to be these days into calisthenics and stuff like that as well. So that's, that's basically just using your own body weight, isn't it? Aye, uh, aye, definitely. A lot, I do a lot of press-ups as well. Aye. Right, and obviously we've, we've got you on to chat about, about what you're doing now in Dubai, but obviously we, we, we want to speak to you a wee bit about your, about your boxing career. You had a, a very, very successful successful boxing career. The first thing I wanted to ask you, Paul, for, for you looking back at your career, what was, what was the one moment in your career that really stood out to you? What was the highlight of your career? I suppose... You- you know, winning, winning the world title and, and the, the record time that I done it in my sixth fight. I mm-hmm. suppose that that's got to be the. Uh, I suppose any, any fighters highlight. Uh, you know, the, the, every fighter wants to become world champion, if possible. You know, you some fighters mm-hmm. are just can they maybe they want to win, you know, an area title or a British title, and they're happy and they're going to achieve a lot more. You know, my, my goal for day one was to become world champion, uh, and I was fortunate enough to get the opportunity to fight. And thankful, and uh, I, I grabbed it with both hands and won my first world title in kind of record time. And the opportunity came up pretty quickly for me to fight for a second world title, and we took it. And the first attempt, I failed because I fought Jose Camacho for Puerto Rico, who was the, the reigning champion, and he beat me in points. And I closely disputed a uh, mm-hmm. title fight, and I ended up, I think, I had 36 or 40, 42 stitches over two eyes. You know, I was pretty badly cut up, so I had 10 months off. But I couldn't really, you know, just to let the eyes, the eyes get stitched up and to let the eyes heal, basically. So I had about a time off, 10 months, and then I get the opportunity to fight. Well, we were supposed to find a rematch. We had a rematch agreed. And he get an uh, opportunity to fight Michael Cabal, who was a kind of pound for pound in my division, you know, unified champion at the time. <clears throat> in fact, he just lost to Humberto Gonzalez, I think, on the second time. So yes. the title, he was going to fight for the vacant, he was going to fight for the, the WBO title. So he got the opportunity to fight for it. Camacho went there and I was left kind of in the cold. And then we sang, we did get an agreement for top rank and match room. I was going to fight the winner. So that was quite good. And it was arranged. Carbaha won the fight. We were going to fight on the 22nd of November. And in the Indian Reservation in Phoenix, Arizona. And then Carbajal went for his third fight with Humberto Gonzalez. So he gets stripped of the belt. And I fought for the vacant title. And that's yeah. how I get the opportunity to fight for the, the, the second I, 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 I could probably have made strawweight again. You know, I went back to the strawweight division. Com- light flyweight was comfortable for me. So mm-hmm. when the opportunity came, I took it and I went for there. I got my second world title. I think I was, I was the only fighter to win two world titles in, nine, in 10 fights until Naya Inui 
from Japan, you know, the monster. You know, he, I think he's a three-weight world champion now. He, he, won, he, he equaled me. He, he, won a, he won his first world title fight in his sixth as well, the same as myself. And then he went on and won his second world title fight in his seventh fight. So he, he, he kind of broke my record. There'd been only one. So he, there was two of us in that. And then Lomachenko won. He put the two of his back a spot because he won it in his third fight. Mm-hmm. He won his, his first world title. Then, and, and both, both anyway and Lomachenko, the only two guys to have three world titles within 10 fights. And I'm the only guy to have two world titles within 10 fights. What was that? Just to take you back, because uh, obviously you get that that massive fight and you're so early in your pro career. What's what's the mindset like going into that? Because um, it's were you expecting to get that opportunity as early as you did? I was hope. I mean, when, when I turned professional, I was already I was highly successful as an amateur, traveling the, yeah. the circuit and fighting all the titles. I you know com- competed in the the Commonwealth, the Europeans, the Worlds, the World Cups, you know, numerous amounts of multi-nations across the world. So I had a lot, I had, man, I had over 200 fights as an amateur. So I, I was probably getting to the stage, and I was late turning professional. James, I was 24, and it probably mm-hmm. my way. They turned professional a lot earlier. So I was champion at 24, and what my main, my main ambition an objective, I should say, when I was turned professional was to fight for a world title. You know, and I kept busting my manager's ass every day. When, when can you get me a title fight? When can you get me a title fight? You know, and they just kind of laughed and says, listen, you know, we'll get you something at some point. And when Nigel Ben fought Mauro Galvano and I defended his WBC title at the exhibition centre, I was on the undercard. And... I'm trying to think. I think Drew Dockett, he was chief support to Mauro Galvano. And uh, I remember being in the Albany Hotel in Glasgow and Barry Hearn says to me, Paul, oh, I need a wee word with you. Let's get a chat. So he says, listen, I'm moving you up to chief support. The Dockett fights off. I think it was Drew Dockett anyway, but he says, to fight off, your chief support, I want you a wee performance tonight because I've got a lot of guys for a lot of the different organisations here watching. He says, performance tonight, you'll fight for the world title in 10 weeks' time. I said, nothing like putting a bit of pressure on me, you know, <laughs> the, the, the day of the fight. So that was it. But I took it in my stride. I mean, I fought. I had a good performance with <clears throat> Kevin Jenkins. I went the distance. It was live, you know, ITV and the, whatever, Eurosport and whatever other stations, you know, they, they were airing it to. So I knew it was the next day. That, that night, I knew he said, you'd, you'd be fighting in 10 weeks' time. So that was it. So I had a few days off back in the gym and we just prepared. I had a couple of different opponents put in before I actually thought who I was meant to be fighting. Or who I did fight, I should say, no, who I was meant to fight. I was meant to fight a guy from El Salvador, Re- Re- Rene Dimas Valley, who had 11 and 0 with something like 10 KO, but it was something to do with his medicals. And then I fought Fernando, Fernando Martinez, who had 40, 42 fights with 36 knockouts. So it was wow. a big. Uh, so it was a big day, but I had every confidence because I'd fought so many different fighters, you know, as, a, as an mm. amateur. And he was a southpaw, also, you know, and having that in your first place didn't really affect, it didn't bother me you know, with being a southpaw either. That, that's one thing as well. When I looked at your amateur record, it was you, you were extremely well travelled in that as well. You fought yes. all the international, so yeah. stuff like that, rather than just staying domestically as an amateur, that's obviously must have benefited you, as you say, moving into the pros, getting that wealthy experience behind you. Yeah. Hey, listen, do you know something? Sometimes your hardest fights are the guys go home because they want it. They want the way. They want what you've got, or they want to get what you've got. You know I mean so? Sometimes they're the hardest fights. But obviously, you, like you see in your career, you, you set out to become a world champion, and I did, you not I, only did it. You did it once. You did. You did it twice. Obviously, two different weight classes as well. Um, the, the other thing as well, when you when when your boxing career came to an end. What was that? Was that a difficult transitional period for you, f- finishing up as a pro fighter, then looking on to the next thing? No, I, th- I think at the time I, I was in London at the end of my career training mm-hmm. fine, and I decided, when, when, when I decided to quit, I, d- I got offered another a third world title fight, uh, flyweight, a super fly, super flyweight, in, in Africa, mm-hmm. and uh, I decided I, I went back home spent some time at home and just decided, you know what, 
No, I'm not going to take it. I was getting, I was, I was doing things business wise. I was, I was into, I was setting up businesses and in different investments, and I just said, you know what, I'm going to, I'm just going to call it quits where I'm. And I went to World Hotels, and I was happy and quite content, you know. And it, you get a lot. I know, I know a lot of guys, a lot of fighters who have left the sport, and they come back and they come back. You know, it's it's hard. You know, do you know what? It's a hard bug to get rid of. Yeah, it's it's, it's something you definitely see. But were you yeah, quite conscious of that when you left the sport? That you that was that you wanted to. That was your, you were away and you weren't weren't ever thinking about coming back, or was that temptation there? No, I always thought about it. You know, I always mm-hmm. thought, you know, well, will I get by it? Will I make a comeback? But I never, I, I started getting dragged into different things. So I never went back. And I was glad to get arrested because I was, I was active for probably a teenager. Mm-hmm. I was active, you know, and I remember when, when I was growing up, I didn't have boys' holidays. You know, my, my, my holidays was traveling with the team somewhere. You know, sometimes I would travel this country, come back. Travel the next country, come back. Travel the next country. You know, it was a, it was just a circuit. You know, a constant circuit. For, and I was fortunate enough. I went in mostly every tournament. You know, you know, guys. You know, you, you, guys die. You know, they, they, they break your arm to go to all these tournaments. And I was getting to go to every tournament. And sometimes you think, Fuck, you go, I'm traveling again next week. You know, but I was fortunate enough and blessed. Aye, aye, because that, that's the other thing as well, I suppose, you, you sacrifice a lot for boxing, because you, you effectively yeah. give up your, your youth and your teenage years and all that stuff, and uh, I guess that means when you retire, so you've got a wee bit of time to just relax and, yeah. I guess, reflect on your career as well. Yeah, so uh, you do, uh, you, you, I suppose, I think, you know, you're, when, when you're going through your career, now I understand when a lot of people say enjoy it, and mm-hmm. at the time, it's not I didn't enjoy it. I probably didn't appreciate it at the time. You know, I appreciate what I achieved. Yeah. You know, and it's not only later in life, I think people say, you want to want to take in 10 fights? You know, and I don't, I don't think uh, that ever sunk in when I won my first World Hotel, or even when I won my second World Hotel, I don't think it ever sunk in because I think I put enough pressure on myself. It was expected. Yeah. So is it one of the things, the further you get away from it, almost the more you can sort of look back and have that bit of appreciation for what you accomplished? I think so. And, and I see a lot of guys. I, I, listen, I had a lot of luck as well. I get the opportunities at the right time and I took it with, I grabbed it with both hands. See what I mean? Because I see a lot of talented fighters, you know, don't get the opportunities, you know, through a, a numerous amounts of reasons. And politics sometimes, you know, is one of the reasons that I don't. And I was fortunate enough at the time I got the opportunities. So I don't, you know, I'm not saying, you know, I, I was the best in the world. You know, I, I achieved to be the best in the world and fought and won world titles and I get the opportunity. So I'm thankful for that. Yeah, that, that's something about boxing that maybe you, you'd be able to speak on. Sometimes there's those fights, like obviously Mayweather, Pacquiao springs to mind, but it feels like you, you just get deprived of fights because of different things. Do you think that's something that ultimately can, can hurt boxing uh, when different organisations and promoters don't get the fights put on that the, the fans want to see? No, I don't think so. It's, it's, it's been, historically, it's always been that way. And when you mm-hmm. look at, I understand, like say, mixed martial arts, it's been, look, look, talking about the MMA still, I mean, you've got guys in UFC who fight for UFC, that's mm-hmm. it, right? You've got guys in one championship fighting one championship. You've got guys in Bama fighting Bama. You have guys in cage warriors fighting cage warriors. You know, what is that, that? That's for organizations, okay? Mm-hmm. Now you've got WBC, WBA, WBO, and IBF. That's the four, and then you've got the IBO, but that's the four main, main organizations. Now, if they were just single and you're in the ratings, and that's the only fight that you could fight for. So let's say you've got Tyson and AJ in that rating, and that one top 10, they're going to fight. But you've got yeah. different organizations, and what you've got is you've got the governing body say, you know, for one right, AJ, you need to make a defence. Tyson, you need to make a defence. And you've got guys in the top 10. And I, I, I do understand that money ultimately talks, you know, when they're mm-hmm. going to fight and who they're going to fight. But what you get in between that is you get promoters, different promoters, different organisations, different TV networks. All want a, they all want that bit of the, the pie. They want the full bit of the pie. And it's trying yeah. to come to compromise and say, right, OK, and then, then most of the time the fighters want to fight each other and they're happy to give away. But it's the promoters and people remember going, no, 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 that's not happening. That's not happening. 
So that's just politics has historically been there and it's always going to be here. I guess it's in the sense it's like any sort of corporate world. It's all it all boils down to cash at the end. You know, it's, it's, a rich, it's, it's a richest game when you make the most money, you know, in combat industry. You know, yeah. because you look at UFC, you've got guys like Connor who's making a lot of money. But he's 1% of fighters within that organisation. You know, you go to boxing, you've got Fury, you've got AJ, you've got, you know, Wilder. You've got umpteen, even the lower skill heavyweight fighters are making more money than UFC fighters. Aye, it's, it's, there is a big, dis- that's one thing we, we pay in mixed martial arts, there's a big disparity um, yeah. from the, the, the top percentage of guys, and the only way you can make the money is getting to that top, and it's so, so difficult. Yeah. Um, it's well, I mean, the fighters, the fighters, James, that get to the top and don't make a lot of money. You know, mm-hmm. no, where, where do you make the money is if you draw in the fans. You know, and you've got, I mean, Connor, when he, Connor got my attention, that's why I started watching a lot of the mixed martial arts, because... It's not just his fighting skills and what he was doing. You know, he, he, he was doing what he was saying he was going to do, but it was the build-up and how he was, you know, and at the press conferences, the weigh-ins. It's exciting. And that's what, ultimately, it's not the TV networks. Viewing figures. Bums nice. and seats. Yeah, it's the same across all combat sports, I guess. Obviously, Tyson Fury, he's, he's done very well. Obviously, he's got all the talent there and skills, but uh, he's very marketable. Um, and I wanted to speak to you a wee bit about your coaching as well now James I know you you've got a few things to, to ask about from the coaching side so we'll bring you in for here Mo yeah um, I think the, the, the big thing for me is I'm aware of how good a, a coach Paul is um, and I think everybody still he's, he's well known as obviously a world champion fighter like a, a world class level Boxer coming out of Scotland, which which there isn't a lot of, um, but I, I don't think a lot of people know about how involved in coaching he is. I know he's I know he's worked with a, a lot of a lot of really good boxers and stuff. So just basically, could you tell us kind of what boxers you worked with before, Paul? Uh, I, when when I was in, when I was back in Scotland, I was working with God. I worked with Craig Doherty when he fought Pollock for that British yeah. Masters title. I've worked with Chris Hughes when he fought for the Commonwealth title. I've worked with John Simpson when he fought Choi for the WBC title, when he fought Di Davis, and when he fought Paul Appleby. Uh, Jonathan Sloy when he won his WBC. Uh, Xander White. I'm trying, to, trying to, I'm trying to think of Craig McEwen. Uh, I worked with a lot, a lot. I worked with a number, of, a lot of guys. I worked with quite a few, James. Yeah. And then when, when, I, when I came to Dubai, I wasn't working with fighters. I was, I was working as a second and doing cuts. I do a lot more cuts now. You know, what with you know, different corner when the fighters are. I worked with John Cavana last year, Cavana last year, doing his, yeah. wrapping his guys' hands and doing the cuts from when he had these guys over in Dubai fighting. Yeah. And so so I, yeah. I enjoy it. It me involved, but as I'm not involved fully every day, you know what I mean? Is it something you would like to be involved more with me, coaching? <clears throat> Do you know what? Have I got someday, James? You know, it's you, you. You do it day in, day out, so you understand. Sometimes it's a you know, no, you don't get any credit for what you do. You know I mean, and you you don't make any money, to be honest with you, unless you've got somebody fighting the heavyweight title face. But if I get somebody, you know. Uh, who was dedicated with, with the potential. Yeah, of course I would get involved. It depends, I suppose. It's, it's having the right person at the right time, isn't it? And everything adds up. I don't yeah. mean financially. I'm just talking about attitude-wise, discipline, commitment. So, so it, they're possibly going forward, yeah, maybe at some point. See, I'm, Can I just... I think uh, that, I think that um, but boxing coaches are completely different to martial arts coaches. Are, are, I try to study a lot of boxing coaches because they, they boxing trainers more because they're, they're better at it. They, they deal with, with guys on a one-to-one basis more. Whereas a lot of, from my experience, a lot of guys, even fighters in the UFC are training in classes and, and groups and stuff like this. And the, the guys I've had success with is guys I, I spend a lot of time one-on-one with. Like uh, the same way I've seen boxing coaches then. Um, it's just I, I think for, for me I've learnt more studying boxing trainers like right right back to like Eddie Futch and 
Ray yeah. Sennons, reading about these like masters um, yeah. compared to uh, there's masters obviously in MMA, uh, martial arts coaching and stuff like that but the, the guys that teach boxing to that level are, are better trainers than, than most of the people you you encounter in martial arts in my experience um, so I think with some of your knowledge with, in, in that experience uh, with the, the amateur career the world titles and stuff if you can find like, if you can find like that right student type of thing, you can yeah. uh, do something really special. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. It's just, but it's just getting that right student. And you know, in Dubai, Dubai's get there's a lot more boxing shows. MTK have came here now. They've set up and they're running shows. Maybe a couple of shows a year. They're just set, kind of set up, so, which is good for the for the, the region. You know, and it's, it's it's bringing a different sport in, into this market. The amateur association are not. I spoke to them a few times. They they, they they don't have a lot of a great talent. You know, they're, they're not certainly not get any fighters who are going to be going to the next Olympics. In my opinion, as of yet, it's not saying <coughs> they can't even get it in time. So, it's developing here as well. And the more shows that are put on, then you, you never know what comes through the door here because I live here. Uh, and it's a bit hard unless you get a fighter wanting to come over and you know, stay here and do a camp here. So we'll, we'll see what happens, James. We'll see what happens going forward. But I agree with you. You know, there is a lot more. I think there's a lot more success in one-to-one -one working with the fighters. And it's different. You know, you and I have done, I've, I've done the, 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 the kind of workshop at your place last year or the year before. And there's a difference from... That everything's balance related, as you understand that, you know, from whether it's, you know, any combat sports, whether it's judo, karate, jiu-jitsu, boxing, mixed martial arts, it's about anticipation, understanding the movement of the balance and the timing and the placement of the feet and hands working together. And I think boxing needs a lot, you know, you need a lot more one-to-one -one on boxing, I think. And I, yeah. I, I don't understand, you, 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 your discipline's really hard because you've got you've, you've jiu-jitsu, Wrestling, kickboxing, and boxing all rolled into one one discipline, and yeah. you have to try and master every every one of them. So it's a it's a hard that's hard. And I think when you've got a class and you're taking four, even if you get four or five fighters all training together, it's hard to give them that one to one attention, attention to detail. Yeah. You know, it takes a long, long time. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. tough. It's tough. Eh? It's tough. So did when Paul was in doing the. Doing the seminar, uh, uh, was your tire level he was at? Um, is that something for you, James? Then you can just sit back and watch how how Paul's coaching and what he's saying, and you can just try and pick up everything, every bit of information you can. Yeah, I, I try and I try and pick up as much information, details, kind of knowledge as possible. Uh, right down in my note details, like the, the smaller the detail, the better. Um, and that's kind of stuff I got for that seminar, but it's it's like you just try and you try to take stuff for everybody. You're trying to look, look, absorb information and, and and then try and put your own kind of fingerprints on it and and even stuff like how he was delivering the, the session is is important and how he deals with with people at that at that seminar. I think there was like thirty five people there and there was guys in there who were fighting in the UFC and then there was a couple like women who are in who who kind of train recreationally and it was interesting for me just to watch how Paul treated them and he, he, he knows how to treat them like depending on who he's working with and and he can either dumb down the information or he can go into his massive amount of details with, with the simplest of techniques we've never done anything fancy at that seminar it was all about foot placement like what Paul was saying and balance and put, pushing and pulling and um, so it, for me as a coach it's, it's just nice to see how how guys with that that level of knowledge and, and understanding of sport, put it across, and if I can take something from it, then it's then it's a massive thing for me and, and also for my students. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the other thing as well, Paul, is obviously you're you've came for the highest of highs in boxing at the at the highest level to then putting on a gi, putting on a white belt, <laughs> throwing yourself into <laughs> Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Me and James spoke about this off camera. And I, I think that's a really hard thing for some guys to do, to go for being in their sport, being at the highest, highest level, to then go into yeah. a sport where you're a novice. And, and it, yeah. I find sometimes we get high-level guys coming into other sports, it can be quite humbling, and maybe the ego doesn't allow them to progress in that sport. But you've, you've went yeah. in and 
done really well with tellers, but it was like, we've got you into, into jiu-jitsu and what those first classes were like that you, if you can remember. I was training with, I think at the time I was training with, with Craig Doherty, who was fighting, all of a sudden he was fighting <laughs> MMA. Mm-hmm. And I was training Mark, Mark Connor, you know Mark? Yeah. One of the black belts for, you know Mark, James, yeah. Mark Connor. Yeah. yeah. And I think he has as well. And I think it was Mark Connor said, me, Paul, you should come and try with jiu-jitsu. I said, I don't want to do jiu-jitsu. He said, you'll like it, you'll come and like it. I said, but I don't want to do it. He says, if you come to jiu-jitsu, I'll train you. And you can train me boxing. I says, but I don't want you to train me boxing. I says, I want you to pay me what I'm doing now. But I went one Sunday, and I was in, I was in, there was only, it was me and one of my clients went, four of us, and I was in there for two hours with a gear, and I went, wow, this is unbelievable. <laughs> you know, and Craig just, they, they just battered me for two hours, but I just thought, I'm not getting punched. And Aye. then I was, I was back the next day and Guy said to me, says, you back again? I went, I'm back again. And then I was back the next day. Then the next day, then it was, I was in in the morning and in the afternoon, in the morning and in the afternoon. Then I was in morning and afternoon and night time. I just, I just got obsessed with it. And then I was, I, I think I competed no long after I started. Yeah. I, I fought in the, I fought in Edinburgh in the, the Scottish Championships. And then just before I came to Dubai, I fought in a, a nogi, a submission only nogi. And I fought against Reese. I got drawn against Reese. But at the time, I'm not sure what weight. What weight is Reese, James? He's bigger than you. <laughs> um, he's, he's, he's bigger. He'd have been under 65 kilos maybe then, but he, he fights it. He fights MMA at 61. Um, Reese. Uh, he, he, he was bigger than me. But anyway, I weighed in, and there was nobody else at my weight. To compete, so I weighed at 59 kilo, and it, and it was Gary, I think. No, it was Mark, Mark, Mark what would you call him? Marcus? Yeah, Marco, Marco, is it Marco or Marcus? Marco Nardini. 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 He says, There's yeah. no one else in it, your weight. He says, The next weight is 73, but I can give you your money back, or I can move you to 73. I went, I'll fight at 73. So I fought, and I get drawn against Reese. So I fought, it was first five minutes submission only. Then first they score a point, so I think we're on the map for nine minutes, and uh, we just get a pass, and he, he won, and that was it. And then that was me. I, I, I moved to Dubai. What, what Reese is it? So I know because I'm trying. Like, I've a couple. Reese McEwen, 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 it's crazy that going for getting into jiu jitsu. So was it that? Did it give you that competitive edge back again? And it's just an eye opener seeing all the. You know what? See, see, when I started, I was getting into some shape, just mm-hmm. just with the pushing and pulling, the weight, different weights and all that, and I, enjoy, I just enjoyed the the workout basically. But I was getting battered every day, every single day, and I was training with wee hissy a lot, and we hit every single day. Arm barred me every day, boom, 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 and I thought. I need to get better at this. So I kept coming back. I kept coming back because I wanted to get better. I didn't want to get armbarred every day. So well, it's, 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 use him as a rag doll, honestly. Practicing all your stuff on me. What's that old saying? They say every, every black belt's a white belt or didn't they stop coming? Aye, uh, that's that. So that was it. I came. <clears throat> when I came to Dubai, I started in Dubai. And again, and I had a bit of a sabbatical when I came here for mm-hmm. a which was a year, honestly going to be a year, went on for about two years, and I just rolled every day. Just mat time, I get mat time. And there's quite a lot of jiu-jitsu in Dubai, isn't there? It's compulsory in the schools in Abu Dhabi. It's mental. Uh, so, what, what, when I come over, I, I, was, I, trained, I trained honestly with a guy called Henrique Santana, good coach, good guy, Brazilian, European champion, British champion, uh, I think he's maybe a four or five straight black belt. You know what I mean? Dan Black belt. Uh, and then he's left. And when he left, I went to UFC gym and trained. And I trained with the guy, the same trainer I've got a with just now. A guy called Taba, Taba Altaha uh, from Jordan, who trains, he was one of uh, Andrew Garval's students. So I've trained with him. And when he left UFC, I just followed him. And I've, I've been with him ever since. So I, I've trained with him. So he gave me my, my purple belt. And my brown belt. You pretty, pretty much um, carried over that that work ethic that you had that, that made you an elite level, a world class level boxer. I trained hard, James. You've just you've just carried over to jiu jitsu. 
it's, it's impressive, man, because we've, we've had lots of, nowhere near your level of a boxer in, in here, and they'll come in and they'll, they'll hit the pads all night, and then you say, like, maybe try this jiu-jitsu class, and then some wee, some wee guy who looks like a nerd beats them up, like chokes them and stuff, and then you'll never see them again, they'll be like, fuck that, and then... <laughs> They start making excuses. I like, I like to win. I like to try. I like to try. I like to win, though. I must admit, I do like winning. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you must. Uh, you, you obviously you don't get to brown belt without kind of submersing yourself on the technique side of jujitsu. Yeah. Um, and it, it's fascinating. How how do you compare? I actually think teaching jujitsu has made me a better striking coach. Like a, like you were saying earlier, it's the same principles. Fight combat's all the same it's, stuff. It's all time and distance and balance. Um, how how do you compare jiu-jitsu with boxing? In what way? What do you mean compare in what way? Like even just the process of learning it, like you like the emphasis on technique and, and conditioning, um, and it, what you're saying like the, with the crossover stuff, like it's just you, it's both of them are obviously completely different, but there's there's definitely similarities there. Can can you expand on that? Like what what I, I think you think them when I started uh, jiu-jitsu, very quickly I understood the difference. I mean, I, I think I, I remember Rome with you one time, and you said to me, you use the hands a lot, you fight the hand a lot, which is good. So I understood, I think I understood that pretty, pretty quickly, James. You know, yeah. keeping range and distance, you know, because if somebody gets close to me, especially an offensive fighter, you know, a pressure fighter, they want that pressure on you. So I understood keeping that range of distance to avoid certain move, whether it's a choke, armbar, you know, or whatever it may be. So I understood that pretty quickly. And I understood yeah. using the hips and the shoulders, you know, and, and the feet is positioned, you know. Boxing, her hands are here constantly. My hands are like constantly when I roll. My hands are yeah. never away from my chin. They're always in close because I don't want to get armbar. I don't want yeah. to get, you know, a Kimura, or, you know, American. I don't want to get to my arms. So I'm always pretty tight. I've got quite a... I've got quite a tight guard, you know, yeah. and I've got a good retention guard as well. But I would say, do you know what? I would say boxing's harder long term, but yeah. jujitsu's harder short term because there's so much to pick up. When you think about it, there's only really six punches you throw in boxing, okay? Yeah. The one, two, the right hook, left hook, right uppercut, left uppercut, and that's it. And it's how you compile them and put them together to get different, you know, variations of combinations. But what people don't understand and neglect is the feet work and the range. Yeah, yeah. You know, I see guys hitting bags and they're too close to a bag, you know, and sometimes it's it. you know, and you think, oh, he's too close. And I don't, I don't say anything because it's not my, my business and I don't want to come across as, oh, I'm an auto, you know, but I'm a bit of a perfectionist, whether it be in, in boxing or, or jiu-jitsu. I like to perfect things and get them done right. Yeah. That's, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have, be, have achieved the things you've achieved without that, but that mentality of striving for perfection, um, yeah. like that, that's something I've, I've noticed with, with elite level fighters that they've, they've all got that an obsession almost. Uh, I think I think with me, James, even growing up, it was an obsession. All I done was box, train, well, train, 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 train. You know, and I was in the gym every. every we never had days off when I when I was a, a child growing up. We were in the gym seven days a week training. You know, yeah. running in the morning, you know, train, train at night time, and what, what, away with the camp. What, what do you think about, just kind of touching on that subject, what do you think about these, we, we see this a lot in MMA where guys, they, they, they call it a fight camp, they get a fight match and they, they hammer it for six to eight weeks and then you'll not see them for a wee bit and then they'll be like, oh, I've got another fight. Whereas I, I prefer guys that are in all the time. Like you're trying, like yeah. you touched on earlier, you're trying to learn four areas of combat sports like you, you stand up you're wrestling you're grappling on the ground and strength and conditioning separate and then you kind of do that in an eight week block do you know what I mean it's even you, you, you can but, but, but if you look at the um, the percent the one percent of fighters in any category whether it be UFC boxing you know any high combat sport you know any any, any elite athlete of any any the the one percent will always train and they're yeah. always kind of close to their weight or watching their weight. You can't, you can't stop for, you know, you have a fight. You might have a day or two days off, even a week off, you know, depending on how hard your fight was. If you're banged up, if you're cut, if you're bruised up, you can't move. 
you know, but you're always back into the gym, but you don't always need to train hard. When you look at it, someone told me years and years ago, see when you see racehorses training, yeah. they're not flat out of time, but they're always running. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's the it's same, the... You, you, have to, you have to keep everything working, in my opinion, but that's maybe just me, you know, because I, I have an obsession with keeping fit. You know, the, the, and I think what it also does is it keeps your mind strong. Yeah, yeah. And, and plus you're learning all the time. Like you're, learning you're always that. learning, James. The minute yeah. you stop learning, you, you're actually finished. Yeah, yeah. I'm still learning. I'm still, I see guys in the gym and go, God, I never, I, you know, I need to try that myself. And you know, you're always learning. It's less the, the king of white belt mentality, isn't it? It's like that, just pick up something new, pick up something new. It's a good, good uh, kind of trait. Uh, uh, but you, you know, you're always learning, but it's good. To, uh, I like guys who you always see in the gym who are always training. I like that. I like that attitude. You know, I work yeah. a lot of fighters who just, they go in benders and you think it dra- 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 drives you mad. You're quite lucky in that sense, James. We we a lot of guys that are in the gym at the moment and your fight team, that core group you've got. The guys are never really out in the gym. Obviously, this current situation being the exception. So you're, I think you've said it in the past as well. You're quite lucky. You've got a good solid group of guys in there that that sort of like to train all the time anyway. I think that they're fully aware that MMA is still in its infancy. Like it's, we touched on this with the Mark Goddard interview. It's 25, 26 years old, so it's evolving at a rate now. Where if you take six months off, then you fall behind the, the rate of evolution of the game and stuff. So if you can't take time off, right, you need to you need to do your, your your fight, get back in the gym, improve on stuff, and keep pressing on. And the other thing is. It's almost like an arms race, MMA. The, the meta game keeps changing. Like the, the current state of the game is completely different from two years ago. You see it with there are very few guys holding on to titles for, for any length of time because somebody comes up with answers to the problems that, that they guys are, are, are kind of putting on people. So like you, you're, you're having people that are struggling with Max Holloway for a while and then Volkanovski comes along and he's got the answers to the, to the Holloway kind of problem and, and that drags the game forward so the game changes usually in line with the, the current or, or the kind of champions at each each division so you can't take time off I, I know guys are they've burnt out and, and stuff like that they're maybe overtrained or, or stuff gets in the way maybe family stuff and they're like I'm going to take six months off and then I'll come back and I'll pick up um, and Graham Turner's an example I can use an example he went for Cage Warriors world title contender and then he, a, he was in a, a title eliminator fight for the Bama World title and snapped a ligament in his ankle. And it, by the time he rehabbed it and came back, guys that, that couldn't touch him in the gym had, or pa- had passed him just because the game had passed that style. Um, and it, it was a, it's an eye-opener for me seeing that. So the young guys in here, I, I don't need to tell them to, to get in the gym. Like I, There's some guys I need to tell them to get away from the gym more. Um, mm. and if you have that in guys they're, they're going to be easy to work with like, if, if I have to phone a guy and ask him where he is I'll, I'll do it once but if I have to do it twice then there won't ever be a third phone call do you know what I mean and, and it means as a coach they're wasting my time they're wasting their own time and they're wasting their teammates time so most of the guys are unfortunate most of the guys are, are here because they want to be here and if I wasn't here they'd probably still be here anyway I think that's something as a coach you've got to be conscious of as well because we are speaking earlier about the difference between boxing coaches and MMA coaches. It's uh, that time you've got to spend with guys so you've got to use that time on the right the right guys, I guess. It's, it's tough. That's why I, I limited my... I limited our fight team. I ended up with a point last year there was 32 fighters on the team and I was like, I need to get rid of, I need to get rid of some of them. Like, it's, too, it's far too many for one one person or, or me and maybe three assistant coaches to deal with. So now we've had guys pass through and they're, they're no longer competing. Um, and it's, it's dropped the number down. And other things I'll do, like I won't. I used to have months where I'd have 10 guys out on one weekend and then the next weekend I'd six out. So now what I do is I try and t- use time management a wee bit better and don't put them all out close together. And it means I can spend more time on them all individually. Uh, I can use certain guys for, for other camps and stuff, so they're still progressing. They're bringing in for sparring partners and whatever else. So you've seen this with that with Mark Ewan. He's he's been part of Stevie Ray's last two uh, camps for UFC fights, and he's still an amateur. This kid, he's twenty year old, 
but his uh, his his leg was shot up because he's been part. Of, he's been so close to these fight camps for the Michael Johnson fight and stuff. But it's just it's time management with the, with these guys. Eh? But if if they're not pulling their weight, then it doesn't matter what the coach does. Like it, it has to, it has to be a a fifty fifty thing. They need to want it as much as I want it, and and vice versa. Those coaches and uh, kicking about who are, who are riding on the kind of coattails of is super successful athletes who who shouldn't have been anywhere near like UFC level fights. To be honest, hmm. I think that's across across combat sports, isn't it? Really, but Paul, when you were when you were coaching, is that something you're looking for? And guys have got to have that hunger and that that sort of bit in between uh, to make you know, them want to get better. I can relate to everything James is saying. There's nothing worse when you get a fighter, you know, who buggers off either before a fight or after a fight and you don't see them. Consistency is the key in anything. You know, mm. for success, consistency is the key you know, for any success in anything you're doing in life, in my opinion. Aye, I absolutely. You have to work, you have to work, you have to want it, what James says, you have to want it. And I think, especially with boxing and mixed martial arts, which I think is tough man and brutal you know you, there can't be any room for neglect you know in any 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 way you have to get in there 150 percent committed mentally and physically in my opinion the, the other thing since you've been obviously you've you've dedicated yourself and you've put a lot of time in the mat and jiu-jitsu how was that how was that for you in the body what sort of what's the injuries been like or have you been lucky to avoid injury uh, up up to this point I remember when I started, I remember, because I, I used to train with Gary Christie quite a bit as well, and mm. my body was sore. I remember getting up in the morning, I'd be t- getting in my bed, pushing, I'm going, oh my God. And, you know, I mean, it, it reminded me when I was fighting, you know, when in, in camps and, you know, building up towards fights. I, I'm, I always say camps because we didn't have camps. We just trained. We trained consistently, really. You know, we were just up the ante. Depending on when you were fighting, you weren't fighting. It was just you were still in the gym training, going through the techniques and everything else. So I remember going, "Wow, my whole body's sore." I remember seeing my wife, my whole arm sore, and I said to Gary Christie, "Says your body's just probably adapting and changing to different things that you're doing." And obviously, with your age as well, you're you're no twenty years of age. You know, you're, you're a bit older. So I mean, I think what was that when I started jiu jitsu? Forty, forty-six, forty-seven, or something. When I started jujitsu, you know, so it was a lot, a, 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 lot, a lot in the body. But listen, I've got a strong mind and went through it. But it, it was so, and it's like making that change, making that transition. But now I'm okay. I don't have, I have any, and I've, I've had a couple of wee injuries. I remember when I started, I think it was a blue belt. I remember rolling a couple of black belts, and they, I, my elbow popped at one of them. And the, the week before the, the World Pro, two years ago, my, I was fighting at purple and my, my ribs separated from my cartilage. I was rolling with one of my training partners who is, is a teammate and he's a, he's a bit heavier than me. And we have, we have a good physical spa. And my, I, was, I had a zingi, I wasn't in nogi, I was in gi. And I was doing something stupid with the lapel. And as I rolled over on my shoulder, my rib just popped right out the side. And it was a way the cartilage and the rib had separated, so I had, I had a few weeks off, but that's really bad. But I've been t- touched with, I've been very fortunate in regards to injuries. And, um, just, we'll just finish up on this one, Paul. Um, obviously, we've got lockdown currently going on now. Once this is all passed, what's, what's the future for you in terms of uh, jiu jitsu competing and, and just what you're doing in general? I was supposed to compete, and um, what day is this? Uh, this is. I know it's a Thursday, but what, it's 17th. 14th, of April. I, was supposed, I was supposed to compete the 14th or 15th of this month in the World Pro, but obviously I had to cancel. So I won't compete. I've not competed from Grand Slam, which was in Jan. I fought in the Grand Slam in January. I got a silver at Brown, and I fought in the Dubai Pro International in December, and I won the, I won the gold medal at that. Uh, and I fought at 69. I'm a, I had to move up and fight a heavier weight. So I thought I moved up, I won that, I went back to 62. I was waiting to the Grand Slam. So I won't fight him probably until September. Uh, or, or whenever, whenever you know, everything gets back to normal and the, you know, the schedule, the calendar schedule gets back to normal. But we have competitions here constantly. You know, we, we have, you know, submission-only comps. We have, you know, Nogi. We're supposed to fight Nogi 
the week after Grand Slam and get postponed because it was raining, because it was outdoors. So it was oh. going to be in March, but then obviously the coronavirus kicked in and that get cancelled as well. So there'll be a few different competitions opening up probably uh, start for hopefully t- touch wood start of September so I can get back. I'm just trying to get back in and going every day. I'm missing the mats. Have you got a preference to gi or no gi? If I, like two I, I, like, I like both. When I'm doing gi, I love gi. You know, I'm a bit of a lapel freak. I play a lot with lapel. Uh, so so I, do, I, do, I do a lot of that. And then when I'm into no gi, I just I like because no gi, when they're in, if you're, if you're rolling with somebody a lot heavier, they can contain you a wee bit more if they get the gi. Uh, you know, they can, they can stop your movement. Whereas when I'm in no gi, it's harder. It's faster. Yeah, yeah. It's harder to it's hard to stop, and I like going under. I like going, you know, for deep half guard and get under, or get in the back, and then moving on to getting the feet. You know, I've, See, been, I've been working. If, if somebody, somebody comes to your door to want to fight you, you're going to punch him. You're going to take him down and choke him. Hey, button. Hey, button. Hey, it's Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> nah, it's a depends, bit of depends, depends. It depends what size. Just if he's too big, I can't hit him. I just punch him in the, the, the gills. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit of Scottish an answer as you can have given Paul Watson, to be honest with you mate and uh, you're going to when you're coming back or any plans in the future to come back to Scotland maybe see you back in a higher level at some point I'll, 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 come, I'll come back to the, I'll, I'll get back to James's gym and, and train with some of the guys so especially I'll get back and train with Cairn again I, I like Ron with Cairn. Cairn Reed, he's good to roll with I got an education for him he's brilliant yeah I always, I always remember when I started as a white belt and Ron McKinley used to, used to throw me about the place. And when I was back last time, I had a few good rounds with him, which was good. So I got back, roll with James, I, I learned from him as well when I'm back. Uh, I'll, I'll be back. I'll be back. I, I, I don't know when, but I'll be back. That's, that's a good thing as well that you can do that. You can get, get a, pick up a bit of knowledge and, and then you yeah. can partake, pass a bit of knowledge on. So it's a, it's a, it's a sort of two-way street answer and you can it's learn from each other. Definitely, aye. and James James is very knowledgeable uh, as a coach. I must say that as well, and he's, he's had a lot of success. And long may it continue. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, listen, Paul, we won't take up too much more of your time. We appreciate you obviously com- coming on the show and having a chat with us. Enjoy. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, that's been good. And obviously, uh, just for everybody tuning in to the show, Paul, I know you've got your your YouTube channel and stuff like that. So where can people uh, subscribe to your channel? And it's just the uh, Paul Weir World Champion and it just says uh, BJJ Brown Belt. I mean, that, that's it. Or my Instagram, w, uh, WBO Champ. Perfect. And uh, obviously, guys, as well, for the for the higher level podcast, if you pop onto the YouTube channel, hit that subscribe button um, and go over to the higher level Facebook page and make sure you're hitting like and following us on Instagram as well. And we'll keep this content coming to you while we're all currently locked in a house season. Hopefully it stops a few years for losing your minds. <laughs> we appreciate you tuning in. Thanks, guys.